I'm Lawrence Francis, host of Interpreting Wine, welcoming you to the Uruguay Producer Special Series. Across these two episodes, recorded in December 2022 and February 2023, we'll be exploring the modern Uruguay scene in the company of two producers. The most up-to-date producer-led exploration of Uruguay wines available anywhere in podcast format. Do subscribe to be alerted when new series episodes go live. We close out the series today in the company of Francisco Carrao or Bodega Cero Chapeo. Francisco is a legend of Uruguayan winemaking, being the ninth generation of a family of viticulturalists and winemakers. A dynasty that stretches back to 1752 in Catalonia, Spain. Francisco gives us a high-level overview of the family's origins before taking us through the first critical successes of Uruguayan wine in the UK market. He takes us through the development of their project in Uruguay and its early challenges before describing the process of Tanat finding its home in Uruguay before we lead it into a tasting of two wines the 1752 Grand Tradition Petit Mansain Viognier 2019, followed by the Castel Puyo Folklore Tinto, which is 80% Tanat with 20% of Petit Mansain, before we talk changes in sustainability at the winery and their travel and communication plans for 2023 and beyond. Enjoy! I am from a family that uh, we are, uh, uh, I am the ninth generation father to son in wine making, in grapes and wine, starting in Catalonia, in Spain, no? in the north of Barcelona, a little town uh, mm -hmm. uh, called Vilasar de Mar. Uh, uh, so my ancestors start there uh, uh, moving from fishing to grapes. And we start to learn about wine with uh, our father and, and and the environment where we were uh, growth. Uh, uh, it was vineyards and winery. And, and in, in the that in the seventies, eighties, um, I decided to study biology uh, because I like plants and I like also uh, fermentation processes, yeasts, and all that. And, and mm -hmm. I think that was our stimulation to study uh, winemaking. No? Uh, with a, with a basic education in biology, uh, I start to work uh, after um, uh, in parallel with the university uh, in the in the wine analysis in the laboratory uh, of the mm -hmm. family winery, uh, and so uh, little by little I start to learn with the with the with the people there about how to do wine, no? So th that was our mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our first uh, connection. Uh, uh, our family start in 1752. Uh, we have the documents of the first vineyard, and there appear the first brand you are going to taste. No, so 1752. Since 1752 is our our, tra our mm -hmm. traditional brand. We have a, a document of notary of Vilasar de Mar that says uh, that Francisco Carrao Bales bought the first vineyard. And since then, they start to work. They were uh, fishermen, and they start to work mm -hmm. uh, with boats and with uh, grapes. And uh, really, in the 19th century, they start to travel and sell wines uh, because the fa in the family, in the Catalan tradition, uh, one of the brothers should be in charge of the winery, but the other brothers should learn how to uh, how to um, drive a ship and how to do, how to mm -hmm. do commerce first in the Mediterranean but then they start to go to America and in 1843 arrived to Montevideo, Uruguay our first ancestor that was uh, our my grand grandfather in, in 1843 mm -hmm. she he stopped in Montevideo and left the, the ship of, of, this, of the Catalans and start a, a small shop uh, in Montevideo, selling the wine and the olive oil of the family. And then his his father passed away, and they call him, come on here. We are talking about uh, arriving in 16 years old and returning 
back to, mm -hmm. to Catalonia at, with 27 years old. So that gives you an idea of that they were, mm -hmm. he was a young mm -hmm. boy and returned back to be in charge of the winery because he was uh, the older brother and he was uh, demanded by the family that she would be in charge of the winery. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the origin of the connection with Montevideo and Uruguay because uh, my grandfather uh, uh, suffered the crisis of the economic crisis in Europe in 1929 and he decided to move to Montevideo because he has family there already. Because uh, one of the brothers of my grand grandfather uh, uh, stay in that wine shop uh, in Montevideo after uh, his brother go back to to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, the immigration of the family with uh, five childs uh, to Montevideo in 19, 1929 was a little bit more easy and promoted with uh, the family of Montevideo. They told him, come back here. They, they are now planted uh, grapes because in, in, eight, in 1843, there were nothing of grapes, just the grape of the, oh, of the yeah. Catholic Jesuits uh, missions. No? So uh, the Tanat yeah. was already introduced in 1970s in Uruguay by uh, Bascos, uh, French Bascos, Arriague and others. And so uh, in 1929, they, they told him they have now vineyards here, so you can do a start again here in America. And he started uh, a joint uh, project with a Pasadore family, an Italian family that has vineyards. No? So he was the winemaker. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather, no? Car Juan Carrao Sust, was the winemaker from mm -hmm. Villafranca del Penedes at that time. And he... Uh, uh, moved with his family in 1929 and start a winery. They built a, a winery in that vineyard of Pasadore that was called uh, Bodegas Santa Rosa. No? So uh, he was the winemaker. Uh, the Pasadore family were the viticulturists, and so they joined together to improve wine in Uruguay. And at the beginning, uh, in 1930s, uh, <clears throat> the main job of my grandfather was doing sparkling wine, uh, Metal Champenoise, no? Uh, traditional beverages mm -hmm. from sherries from <clears throat> different regions of Europe um, because he has the knowledge to do it. So he started to, to offer uh, the clients a substitution of the typical European uh, beverages. No? Uh, mm -hmm. Also vermouth styles of wines, uh, that kind of things. No? <clears throat> and so he improved a lot the, the, the wine quality of those grapes that were already planted in, in Uruguay. So that, that's a rapid uh, view of, of my ancestors. Uh, and in, in our uh, situation, uh, we, <clears throat> we start to work. Uh, I start to work uh, more, more deep in the winery after my father passed away. That was, uh, mm -hmm. I was <clears throat> uh, already working with him uh, just in the laboratory. But after he passed away, I start to take care of the business with one of my brothers and start one was in charge of the external commerce. That was my brother. And I was in the way making uh, more focus in the production and finishing the university uh, after my father passed away. I was I need to take care of that. Uh, although it was not planned that it was so uh, early, no, but. That was the a little bit how we start to have passion of wine and um, understand more the grapes. And in the 1990s, we improve uh, a lot the structure of our winery, and we start to export mm -hmm. more consistent. Uh, I, I told you in in one of the questions we we produce a Tanat Castel Pujol that was very popular in, in 19, from 1979 was the first vintage to 1989 and in 1990 we or in, no 1988 vintage was the first that reached the UK market from Uruguay it's wine of Uruguay mm. <clears throat> that was imported by Sainsbury's uh, at that moment it was a change uh, a big change no Sainsbury's uh, mm -hmm. and, and they imported with Castel Pujol uh, 88 vintage. And it was amazing that uh, in 1990, it was in the UK market and 
some people like Oz Clark and some writers start to critical comment the one is this mm -hmm. and that is fantastic for a piece of, of lamb and they start to compare it with the knowledge of the UK market that was re related to Madinan or Irulegi or the Basque country of France. No? And they said this standard is much more softer, uh, friendly, but with a lot of strong uh, tannins, but more mature. No? That's, those are the conditions that happen in Uruguay. We have a better maturity of the seeds in, Ur in Uruguay than in Basque region. Mm -hmm. The Basque region, uh, Pyrenees, is more cooler and more and a little bit more slow maturity. So they need to take up the alcohol very high to get that soft tannin of tanat. We get soft tanats uh, in, mainly in Cerro Chapeau region that is very sandy red soils uh, with 13, 14 of alcohol. So that gives a moderate alcohol concentration more, mm -hmm. in, more in harmony with the tannins and the fruits of the, of the grapes. Okay. No, really interesting. And, you know, I, I, as you say, we kind of have, uh, yeah, flown, flown through, uh, yeah, nearly, uh, 300 years of, of, of history. It's, uh, it, it is pretty amazing. Um, but, you know, what I'm also keen to do in, in talking with you, Francisco, is also bring out the modern story, really, of, of the, of the winery. So I wonder if, yeah, you wouldn't mind, yeah, maybe again, you know, take us back into a little bit the, the, the transition, because I, you know, I believe that there's, there's still, you know, more of the story to be told, as I say, to kind of bring us up to date and, and uh, with, the, I guess, the, the growth and, and success of the winery following on from that initial foray into the UK market. The challenge of us in, in the 1990s was how to get tannats, uh, red wines with the character of, of strong tannins, but softer and maturity of the, of the polyphenols. That was a, a challenge all around the world, not only for tannat. Uh, you know that the, the, the most improved vineyards in the world in, in South America and in, in, in it, it was how to manage the vineyards no? <clears throat> to get that maturity. And we <clears throat> we learned that in the 1990s with the um, Australians and New Zealands, uh, New Zealand and, and some regions in Australia have the their same conditions of Uruguay. So we have a, mm -hmm. a more cooler and humid conditions compared to Chile and Argentina, for example. So uh, that was, um, uh, we get, um, I, I did my, finally, my PhD studies in collaboration with, with Adelaide University. And uh, mm -hmm. there with the Henschke family, uh, we start to improve vineyards management. And and we learn uh, uh, with them how to manage what we mean, they, they were discussing in the 90s, the balance between leaves and fruit. No? And the tanat in, in Uruguay is very vigorous. The, the, you have a lot of vigor in the, mm. in the canopy mm. and you have a lot of leaves that if you don't work with to take them out, <clears throat> you don't have a good light uh, <clears throat> exposition to the, to the maturity. Mm. So the, the big changes were in 95 on uh, that we start to make <clears throat> more soft and, and mature fruit. Uh, and not so dependent in the year, uh, more dependent in us. No, if we do the work every year with Tanat uh, and and may, maybe Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc, we will get more consistency every year. <clears throat> so that was uh, the first changes made in in viticulturist uh, management. And um, in Cerro Chapeau region, it was started by my father in 1973. So the the first vineyards, the first first commercial vineyards were 1976 mm -hmm. uh, in Uruguay side because he worked uh, three, four years in the Brazilian side. Uh, that is, so we, we are in the border with Brazil. That northeast part of the country is more continental, more far away from the, from the ocean or from the river plate, no? mm -hmm. the Rio de la Plata. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so we get more um, frost in the winter, for example, uh, as is far away from the sea. And the other characteristic that the, that was uh, searched by my father in, in a collaboration with a Californian company that was called National Distillers, uh, they contract my father to work with the University of California searching for soils. You know? And the, the main characteristic was that they were looking for deep and, and good drainage soil. And that was, they found it just 
because of uh, uh, I would say fort fortity uh, at the side of the border with Uruguay. So when when they were finishing that project with the Californian partners in 1975, 1976, he said we should look for a land in the Uruguayan side. <clears throat> and so he started wow. to search in the Uruguayan side and they discovered their Cerro Chapeu uh, local region that is just 20 kilometers from the main uh, from the first vineyards planted in 1973 uh, by the Californian uh, partners and my father. <clears throat> so they start to plant our first vines in the in Cerro Chapeu winery were planted in 76. Since then, since 79, we start to produce great, uh, wine in, in, in mm -hmm. first in the south because we don't have a winery there and we take the grapes to to Montevideo wi old winery of the family and then we we built finally the winery there in 1997 no? so the, the vineyards were mm -hmm. already 20 years old in, in that region that was this, the second improve of our company winery because the winery was a thought as a gravity fed winery minimal handling of the grapes crashing over the tanks punching down, not any pumping with seats and skins. Uh, and that was uh, starting, uh, the first vintage, vintage was 98. So <clears throat> since then, we improved a lot the, the, the quality of wines because we were crushing just the side of the of the vineyard. No? Then we have four, uh, 500 kilometers from uh, Montevideo, uh, where the old winery was uh, of my father, and we built a winery mm -hmm. 500 kilometers in the vineyard north. So uh, that was uh, the first gravity-fed winery in South America uh, was that. Uh, the second was in, in Argentina and Chile in 2001, 2002. So okay. that was a little bit the, the, the origin of our soils and our region. And uh, the varieties you had there uh, um, mainly are... Tanat, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, mm -hmm. eh, San Merlot, Chardonnay. Um, you have a um, uh, Petit Manseng and Viognier <coughs> um, that was planted first in the south in Montevideo and then was planted uh, in the north. So little by little, we start to discover um, that the relatives of Tanat were grapes that are very well adapted to our conditions. And that would make sense because mm -hmm. Tanat was a uh, hundred years of experience and, and it does very well. And w that's why we brought uh, Petit Manseng, uh, Arin Arnoa is a cross variety of Cabernet Sauvignon Tanat made in France uh, 50 years ago. no? Um, mm -hmm. And some others like now Manseng Noir. Manseng Noir is a relative of, of Tanat, very similar uh, genetically. So we are selecting grapes that we are already uh, knowing that are well adapted that they, they don't demand they demand minimal handling of the vineyard they mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. you don't need to spray as other varieties that are very delicate uh, so that francisco i wonder um if you if you would uh, yeah share something it is because it, it absolutely makes sense and i think that it's fair to say now that tanat is synonymous with uh, uruguay and and uh, you know all of the the marketing and the communication is, is, is very clear about that. Um, I wonder maybe if you wouldn't mind, it can be quite brief, you know, but to, to take a step back and actually talk about, you know, why Tana, you know, why, why is Tana the, the, the grape that does so well in, in that particular terroir, you know, to try to unpick that? Because, of course, then we understand, I think, the, the relatives then will have that success. But what is it about the, the ancestor, the original, that, that is so special or so unique that makes it so suited to the Uruguayan terroir? Well, uh, uh, I think it was uh, um, in the 1870s, it was introduced also Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, uh, and some other uh, uh, Italian varieties like Nebbiolo or Trebbiano mm -hmm. or Moscato Giallo was introduced by Trentino immigrations, Italian immigrations. And uh, from all that um, immigra immigration um, effects uh, of Italy, uh, northern Spain, like Basques and, and Catalans and, and southern France, um, uh, those varieties, <clears throat> naturally, grape growers start to discover after uh, 20 years or 30 years 
that the tanar was very high color, good uh, alcohol production and quantity. No? <clears throat> and at that time, the majority of the producers were grape growers. Uh, many of them during the last 100 years start to produce some wine little by little like happens also in New Zealand, in Australia, in Chile, in Argentina. Many grape growers start to think about doing wine no? with the grapes because they get more money from wine than from grapes. But, mm -hmm. but uh, originally the, the, the characteristic of Tanat uh, was totally uh, not think about, the, nobody planned, I will need varieties from the Pyrenees to, have, to get the best variety. They get varieties from Bordeaux, from Bourgogne, from, from Spain uh, and, and Galicia and from Italy. Uh, Piamonte, mm -hmm. Biolo, mm -hmm. uh, Trentino, uh, Alto Adige. So <clears throat> uh, the thing was that Tanat produced uh, in our conditions a lot of grape. It's very fruit fruitful. On the other hand, it has a good color, so they can do a red wine that is not very like uh, weak, weak in color. <clears throat> and and, and the yeah. commerce at that time was thinking, uh, I need a, a red wine with good color and I can do more wine with that if I put, for example, a Muscat variety. And, and it was a blend, very, tra very traditional mm. in Uruguay, mm. Muscat, that was very weak of color and they put a red and they give fruity. And, and those conditions of quantity, color, uh, good alcohol uh, conditions at that time, we are talking in the end of the 19th century, uh, a wine with less of 10% of alcohol, 12% of alcohol was weak. Uh, for conservation in a wine shop, no, that were they were selling mm. uh, ten liters bags. Uh, those uh, we call it damajuanas, no, of ten liters. The mm. conservation of tanat was always better than other varieties. So those conditions make it attractive, and the grape growers start to ask mm. for mm. Um, for plants and start to plant change. Uh, many of cabernet of the first cabernet sauvignon disappear at that time. Many Malbec disappear because Malbec like a more dry, dry conditions. And we start to discover that, that Tanat likes humidity, cool, cool weather, uh, more rainy, is well adapted to not have problems of botrytis uh, or that kind of, of, mm -hmm. of fungi. And little by little, the producer was working much more comfortable with Tanat and they sell more grapes. And, and little by little start to develop. And it was about 50% of our vineyards were Tanat in, in 1930 or 1940 when my grandfather arrived to Uruguay, 50% 50, 50 were Tanat. The grape growers were doing better business with Tanat with that with other varieties. And so we start to think about how to improve that Tanat that was very, very acid, rustic. Uh, and, and that start to improve winemaking we can say just in the 1970s, no, uh, to the palate that you know today, no. Many years ago, they blended with Moscatel to make it softer. Moscatel has very weak acidity. Tanat has a lot of acidity, and they make it. Oh, this or oh, it was like a claret, no. The, oh, this claret, oh, it's that's more more comfortable than that a deep strong tanat. And so, little by little, was uh, the the conditions why tanat was so. Uh, develop in Uruguay. No? It's also fascinating to understand the context, you know, in uh, the, the qualities, as you say, you know, the, the conservation, the, the length, the, I guess really the, the robustness of the, of, of the finished wine was then also hugely important because I, I guess it, it, there were um, greater variations really in terms of how the wine would be stored, different temperatures, um, different exposure to air, and, and all of these different things, which, you know, were, were obviously, um, yeah, were, 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 were better able to be withstood by, by Tanat. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was in that context then that, you know, as, as well as all of its other um, qualities, that, that kind of came to the fore and, and I guess was attractive for everybody, people who were selling it, people who were consuming it. And it just, you know, meant that they had good wine to, to drink kind of for, for, for that much mm -hmm. longer. Um, fascinating. And, and I think it also, yeah, gives a, gives a, a really good insight, you know, your story into the connection with Europe as well. I think that I think it's it's again, it's always um, interesting to understand the origins because they, uh, I'm guessing that you know they, they continue to inform how people drink as well. 
um, you know, the, the interplay with obviously wine and food and local cuisine, I, you know, and I, these are all um, important things as well. So um, that being said, I, you know, I want to kind of take us right up to uh, modern day. And, and I'm, I'm sitting here, uh, you know, talking to you and, I'm, and I've got well, two bottles of, of your wine in front of me, um, one white, one red. And uh, yeah, I, I think it would be, you know, fascinating to to kind of make a link really between what you've just told us there in terms of that story, that history, um, and maybe the way that I think it would it would make most sense is actually to to maybe you know orientate us to where these grapes are being grown. So we're, we're now, of course, we're, we're back up in the north, um, but I understand that actually the the environment in which um, the grapes are being grown is is really quite interesting, and that that then is being reflected into the to the grapes and then into the final wine. Mm -hmm. So um, some information about the region of the... So uh, you are tasting now a Petit Manseng there, no? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and Petit Manseng right. is a very, very strong uh, concentrate variety of white. It's a very particular white because it's very concentrate in very small berries. And we, we mm -hmm. like it a lot because it, it gets maturity without any applications or very low input viticulture uh, in the vineyards. And, and it gives a lot of palate body there, no? Uh, the, the, the addition of Yonier is just to get uh, some uh, freshness and less acidity. Uh, the Yonier uh, get maturity and the acidity go very down. And the Petit Manseng, although it's very mature, the acids is still very high. With a, with a very lively style that it gets mm. the, 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 the um, how you say the body to to age very well it's a style it's a style oh. of white wine that you can age it for 20 years 30 years like a chardonnay um, variety maybe and ambionier is very weak in acidity but gives some roundedness at the end and not so heavy wine no But um, initially, the Petit Manseng was all fermented in barrel. Uh, the first vintage of that wine commercially was 2007. And uh, now we are fermenting just 30% barrel, 70% not barrel for getting the fruit more forward there without any uh, too much oaky style. No? Um, sure, sure. And... And, and, and what about the, uh, the the place where the the grapes are grown, Francisco? How how does it look? The, 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 and soils. This vineyard, part, this particular vineyard, the the Petit Manseng is planted in in Montevideo. So that variety uh, is still uh, at. Uh, it was planted firstly in a in a vineyard we had in Montevideo in 2005, mm -hmm. 2004. And then uh, we planted just three, three years ago an experimental uh, plantation in Cerro Chapeau. The quality of, of the soils there is more uh, stone, uh, small stones uh, in, in Melilla is region. It's a, it's a short area close to the city of Montevideo. And it's um, soils that are uh, more poor than the region of Canelones. That the, the majority of the vineyards of the south of Uruguay are in Canelones, that is a very black soil, more heavy clay. Here is more uh, ballasto, more st small stones, and, and has a, a poor soil compared to the, to the Canelones mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. and, and the experience is that this variety will be very uh, good also for sandy soils, red soils in, in the north, in Cerro Chapeau. So um, that uh, is a good example of a variety that it, uh, we believe It, it will be the best white partner of Tanat. Uh, some people are trying the last 10 years, uh, Albarino, other varieties, no? Mm -hmm. uh, or Riesling, mm -hmm. or, but we believe Petit Manseng is surely a consistent variety, and maybe because it's a relative of Tanat, maybe not, but the probability is there, no? That is, it likes humid conditions, and it gets mature to higher concentration, not not um, missing the acidity, you know. So for white wine, it's a mm, very attractive yeah. variety. Yeah, no, I, I would say it's, um, it, it's, it's really, yeah, it's always a pleasure to, to hear all of those different 
um, components kind of kind of coming together. And uh, yeah, it's uh, of, of course it's it's not as though um, uh, I'm, I'm tasting the wine blind, but um, I can definitely relate what I'm experiencing and what I'm tasting back to to what you you've, you've said there. You know, I mean, I, th- I think you know, there's definitely you know there is the presence of oak, but it's not overpowering. Mm. There, there's definitely a freshness, I would say, and a, and a drinkability. Um, but I think it actually also, it, it seems to occupy this, uh, what I always call, uh, you know, kind of a, almost like a Goldilocks um, wine, you know, it's, it's in that sort of zone where, you know, you could, by all means, I think you, you could, you could enjoy this by itself, but I think it's, it's then also, it can kind of carry you through a meal, mm-hmm. you know, I think it would, it would certainly, you know, pair very well, you know, with more that kind of lighter fare, it's, it's got that kind of, um, yeah, kind of almost like lifted uh, fruit and, I would say, yeah, sort of like an, an, an upbeat character. Um, but equally, you know, I think it, it, it could it could certainly go on and, 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 and age. You know, I think it, it's, um, you know, really, it's in a, it's in a lovely place now. I'm, I'm drinking a, a 2019, I believe. Um, and, you know, we're in 2023 and, it, and it, it still, you know, certainly feels as though it has it has um, a lot of a lot of time ahead of it. And um, I think, on, you know, on that note, and it, it's not just because it's, um, uh, uh, lunchtime here, right. <laughs> um, but I, I'm curious. You know, in, in terms of Uruguayan cuisine, uh, because I think that that's something my listeners always ask about. You know, what what kind of things would you pair with this? Something that's that's Uruguayan and typical. Yes, maybe? we we that's a wine that, as you feel it, is is full body wine, strong, uh, very particular, uh, and long in the palate, and it, it's dry. Mm-hmm. It, although it appears to to be creamy and and rich. It's a very rich uh, body. The if you analyze the sugars, it's, very, it's totally dry, but it's full, so full body, and it's um, it's, it's an interesting variety uh, just for for any kind of, of food. But in particular, we like it to serve it with um, with the moriejas. You know the riz de bois they said in France, no, or uh, in English they said. Um, Ah, okay, yeah. The um, I think we, we call them. Is it sweet breads? Sweet bread. Sweet bread. Yes, exactly. that's sweet bread. Yeah. Uh, we cook it in fire. That no. Uh, usually, we have tasted that in Europe as a, as a plancha in in the in the cooking, but here with fire is very crispy uh, outside the the sweet bread, and um, but it's is mm-hmm. fat, so it give, goes very well with that wine, uh, because you need to clean your palate after mm-hmm. that. Uh, usually, people said we will have a um, uh, sweet bread with a uh, red wine, but that's a very nice wine for that. Uh, and the other kind of things are salads or fresh fruits because it's it's some citrusy there, some lively acidity and citrusy mm. that goes well with any kind of uh, salads. No. Uh, and um, out of curiosity, again, it's uh, probably because it's uh, lunchtime that I'm asking about it as well. But is, is Uruguayan cuisine, presumably, it's it's quite heavily influenced by the sea as well because of its location? Yes, we have a lot of, of fish. Um, we have more fish than, than uh, seafood. Of uh, the only We only have the, the main seafood we have is the mussels and the, like the, the shellfish and the, shellfish yeah. and the calamari. But um, mm. and some um, uh, langoustines, no? the langoustines are grow here in the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, the f- seafood is uh, much is much more developed for the visitors that cooking than for the Uruguayans. The Uruguayans are very very uh, beef eaters, no? We said uh, so mm. because we have. Uh, 12 million, we have four more times more uh, cows than uh, than people here. <laughs> so it's very <laughs> funny. We have also a lot of lamb. So the typical food of Uruguay mm-hmm. uh, is influenced by the Basques, the Catalans, and the and the Northern Italians. And we have a, a lot yeah. of, uh, the difference is that we have a lot of grill, fire, cook it, all, all that in the fire, no? So uh, uh, we have we cook like the Basques and the Catalans, for example, the, the red peppers, the the, the vegetables, um, um, the eggplant, all that crispy in the fire. No, then you take that out. You prepare um, very similar to the Catalan escalivada, no, like onions, 
red peppers and, and mm -hmm. eggplant. Mm -hmm. And that with olive oil, it will be the companion for a, a fish or for a beef or whatever. No? But the okay. main food, the main food is uh, mm -hmm. beef, uh, lamb, and seafood. No, and and, and it's very yeah. nice to live here for me that I like I like a lot the seafood, um, the fish that you go to the market and you get a beautiful fish because the Uruguayans are not so demanding those fishes. <laughs> so it's a good yeah, no, very uh, very very interesting, and and I think it's again super interesting again the context that you've given us talking about those those links back to Spain and, and, and to France. And, um, you know, we see that through the, I, as you already mentioned, that, you know, the, the, those different white varieties, the Albarino, the Atlantic influenced. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting to see that how those, uh, how those cultures come together. Um, however, I, I think it, it would be um, fair to say that, again, the, you know, the, the superstar, the, the most well-known grape, of Uruguay is Tanat, um, so I'm very happy to, to say that I'm, I'll also be um, trying a, a Tanat as well. So we'll maybe move across to to that. Or, and while I pour this out here, um, yeah, maybe shift gears and introduce us to where this is planted and and those conditions really um, uh, where we can find it and and how it's then vinified. So there, there you have the Tanat uh, folklore of Castel Pujol, no? Okay. Yeah. And um, that vintage, it, it should be 22 or 21, maybe 22. No? Yeah, 22. Yeah, so it's, it's a young red wine that was um, the soil. The soil characteristic, I, as I mentioned, some is red soils of Cerro Chapeu, no? that is very sandy. So we get down uh, five meters down with a, with a caving and we don't find the tips of the of the roots that is very interesting and and was that was what the with the university of california we were looking that the, the roots are so deep that they don't suffer excess of water if you have rainy dra drainage conditions are very good so you will you will have many meters of roots without any wet condition excess of wet conditions but on the other hand if you have a very dry seasons like, like this year this harvest 23 mm. is very very dry or the, the roots are so deep that they always find the humidity down there and and as uruguay is not very easy to predict we don't have irrigation uh, because usually we have uh, raining uh, uh, the the maturity season is it could be very dry, but it could be very rainy. No, so that was the challenge that uh, that was that's why it was selected that soil. And the tanat uh, likes um, not to suffer dryness. Uh, in some areas of the south of Uruguay, that the soils are very, very shallow and very um, a lot of clay. No, they suffer uh, the dryness, mm -hmm. and and tanat don't like that dryness, and they don't like also. They have planted tanat in, in, in many regions in the world now. Uh, in, for example, in Argentina, in Salta, the north of Argentina, and it's very dry and depends in irrigation. The, the difference is, is tanat is don't like humidity in the atmosphere, not only humidity in the roots. No, that's a, a particular mm -hmm. condition that makes uh, tanat very attractive for our conditions that we have more humidity in the atmosphere. And, and the, the, the wine making of that wine is, is in an open tank, punching down, crashing over the tank, so not any pumping. And, and um, we have a percentage of whole berries, 30% of whole berries. And we mm -hmm. crash that tank over the skins of the Petit Mansen. So the, the, petit, the white Petit Mansen skins... Um, make what it is called in way making a co-pigmentation no uh, the, mm -hmm. the 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 objective of the co-pigmentation is that the phenols the white phenols of the skins of white wines are very good for stabilization of the color uh, better than the red the same red there was a very mm -hmm. uh, ancestral uh, knowledge uh, for example in toscana they used the treviano for the sangiovese no because it improved the color of the sangiovese so that percentage is because of the skins of Petit Manseng. So it's 80% Tanat and 20% Petit Manseng. That is the rest of the juice that is in the skins of Petit Manseng. 
the particular thing that we were looking there is just that we press that wine after maceration in an open tank and and to get something softer but but more intense fruity in the nose and go to barrel just three four months in barrels just to clean the wine not to <laughs> softer the wine so you, you know that the barrel have two main functions is uh, cleaning the wine and make it softer tannins in this case the softer tannins we were get got with the white grape no skins Mm-hmm. So the co-pigmentation objective was that we get a beautiful red color, still very deep, but with the skins of the white, you get a red, lively red for more time with less demand of barrel. So the, the oak there would be totally disappearing in one after one year of bottle because that wine should be having now six months of bottle, maybe or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and it's very integrated and not uh, affected by the by the oak. I think it's a nice wine to discover the variety, Tanat, because you don't have a uh, you have the presence clearly of a fruit there. And on mm-hmm. the other hand, not waiting for one year more of bottle or two years of more or more of bottle to enjoy it. No, that's the, the characteristic yeah. of. And the um, the label of that wine has a, a tattoo. Tattoo is a mulita, is an armadillo, no. Yeah, you. Mm-hmm. yeah, and, yeah and the yeah. artist there that is a Uruguayan that lives in in Toronto is a young Uruguayan um, that paints paint uh, big walls. No, really, never is mm-hmm. the first labels he's doing because he loved the animals uh, com- uh, fused with some uh, humans characteristics. That's why he he dressed it. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And the technical uh, exp- uh, uh, use for drawing. Is very particular, no? It's all by lines, 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 and yeah, it's um, it's it's beautiful. The the, the 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 to start with the label, it's it's absolutely gorgeous, and I think it's um, I think it actually, you know, these things are all very important. It, it, it's it stands out to me as, as as something that's quite simple, you know, in, in terms of uh, there's only two colors that are that are that are being used yes. there. So you would you would see this, I think. If you were to glance very quickly at the label, you would see it as a, a quite a simple, quite a straightforward um, label. But then, when you go closer and you see the detail, then then you notice, wow, this is a you know, as you say, on this particular wine, it's an armadillo, but it's a it's a fantastically complex um, drawing, and it's you know, it's a beautiful piece of art that's that, that's on there. But it's still, as I say, from a, from a distance, it, it retains that that simplicity, and there's that kind of that white space on the label to to kind of give it the give it kind of the space to to, to breathe. And I think that. Really, the, you know, the reason that I mentioned that is because it, I think it then reflects what's inside the bottle as well. You know, I think it's it's, it's always um, important for me to to try to communicate some of what you're going to get when you open the bottle, because for, for many people, that's all that they have to guide them is the label. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it's, if, if you can't um, try it in the shop or in the in the bar, then you've got to be um, kind of guided by that. And I, I think it what really stands out to me. Um, Francisco, I, you know, I would, I would, you know, wholeheartedly agree with with what you've um, with what you said there, and, and maybe bring up a, a just a you know a, a wider point around around Tanat. You know, it, it's just that that kind of you know, if you're listening and you've never had a Tanat that's approachable in its youth, that doesn't you know in any way, as you've just said, you know, doesn't have the sort of super strong tannins. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it is is really as I'm you know looking at the color of this is is just is, is bright. It's it's um. Um, you know, it's it's vibrant, I would say, and um, maybe due to the winemaking that, that that it sounds as though you've moved away from, and, and maybe other people are moving away from. There's less reliance on oak. There's less reliance on heavy extraction. And as you say, in this particular wine, with with the with the addition and, and with the with the the co fermentation with the with the Petit Mansang, it, it, it's retaining that kind of brightness. So um, you know, all in all, this is this is really you know, I'm really enjoying this. I think it's it's again. Just that kind of Goldilocks, you know, where you've got a, a wine that's approachable in its youth. It's you know, it's only a twenty twenty two, but it's still complex. It's still interesting mm. for the wine geek, but then also I think just stands alone as a as just a nice, drinkable, and versatile glass of wine. If if you're not such a 
a wine geek as I yes. am, <laughs> or maybe you as you are. Yes, and, and the, the idea of that collection um, was also to to show um, not only the the, the beautiful uh, animals that are uh, this is um, this label is uh, supporting a foundation that is called rewilding, a rewilding of native animals, and those animals are in our vineyards. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we're inspired in some of these animals that are in our vineyards. Uh, the other, the other, we have an orange wine. We have a, a pet, pet nut. It's sparkling little frizzante wine, no? Uh, mm -hmm. And we have um, another that is called Carbonica, uh, Aninarnoa Carbonica. So it's all low input wine making inspirations, but with the with the fauna, with the with the animals, mm -hmm. and and so there is. Um, also, a uh, low uh, ca uh, carbonic, um, how you say, said the huella, huella de carbono, low. We, we take out the, you see, you don't have a cap there. We use we use mm -hmm. corks, we, we natural corks, and we use uh, recycled paper. So all the idea mm -hmm. is uh, decreasing uh, the, 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 the carbon footprint. And so um, we we were thinking what we are can get out from there. The bottles, for example, are two two hundred grams less than the typical Bourgogne bottle. No? So uh, that kind of things were inspired uh, by the by the younger uh, uh, people of our company, that is Pia and his staff, no, and her staff. So. Um, that was the, the, the idea, and we joined some uh, good winemaking ideas there. No? Brilliant, brilliant. And uh, really, yeah, the conversation has flown by. Um, but I would, as this time of year, um, you know, we, we, we're coming up to Provine, we're coming up to uh, some planned travels that you have in, into Europe. So uh, I'm just, you know, going to open the, the conversation really in a very, very broad question and, and just ask you know what, what are the things that you're most looking forward to speaking to the to the trade and and to consumers and maybe just you know let us know at a high level what, what are going to be the stops of your uh, european travels this year the, these ideas and develops of of uh, folklore wines of Castel Pujol and others ideas were many in, developed in the last three years so mainly is the presentation of this collection to to the staff of of the importers and to the wine shops and restaurants. Our focus usually mm -hmm. is restaurants uh, and 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 boutique wines in wine shops. Uh, so we would you would not find that in in a big chain. Uh, but uh, the idea is to um, to explain that uh, the continental condition of Cerro Chapeau region, that is our region. Uh, is very attractive for uh, make tanat uh, enjoyable or friendly, friendly styles of tanat, and that we are uh, developing um, in those conditions. We can develop a very low input viticulture um, management. No, so uh, for example, when now we are finishing the vintage, uh, the harvest, we will be finishing this week, uh, maybe Friday. And after that, we start to work in the vineyards all with uh, lamb and, and sheep that clean all the vineyards mm -hmm. uh, because you don't have fruits. They can, during when we, we are working in a project that uh, we will uh, we will get up the vineyards for a pergola with some varieties so as to have sheep all the year. But uh, today they can eat their grapes. So we manage all the vineyards with, with lambs and, and sheep. Uh, for eight months, and that's a very interesting strategy, no? But uh, that kind of thing is what we are uh, trying to explain in vivo in those presentations. Uh, the European market uh, was um, because our family has uh, a process in nineteen in two thousand fifteen. Uh, my brothers stay in the south of the country, and we stay in the north uh, since then. So uh, many of the uh, markets of Europe were uh, left to our brothers and uh, we stay in the United States uh, for five years. That was the main market of, of Cerro Chapeu brand. No? And now we are re recovering again some places in the US, in the UK, uh, in, in, in 
Portugal and, and Belgium, no? that area. So little by little, we are going to start again in Europe to explain about Cerro Chapeu. Mm. Uh, our mm. fo our mm. focus today is not so talking, I explained you some tradition uh, ancestors, but I focus today is to explain that we have that tradition and knowledge uh, by uh, uh, heredity, but our focus is now to understand much better our region, our soil, our um, uh, terroir, no? So that's why we are showing in much of, if you go to our website, you will find a lot of information about the, those terroirs, uh, sandy red soils, conditions, varieties, uh, uh, low input viticulture, uh, working with the, the environment uh, more than mm -hmm. our family mm -hmm. tradition, because uh, that was the, the strategy of the young people. They they like to, to understand more uh, soil, region, uh, weather, uh, uh, that's un poco, that's why we we uh, are trying to show this now in this in pro wine in in United in UK in United States in Brazil we are in, in, in we entered two years ago in the best uh, restaurants of Lima in Peru so the Peruvian food that is very famous now. In the best top restaurants of Lima, we are selling these wines. So we are trying to join the learning of slow food con considerations and all that with the, these wines of a boutique small winery, no? because we are very small in this huge market. No? A massive thanks to today's guest, Francisco Carrao of Bodega Cerro Chapeo. Do visit cerrochapeo.com where you can learn more about the project and find their main social media handles. You can also find links in the description to each of the wines we tasted with their UK importer. Please do help to amplify this episode and the Uruguay Producer Series by sharing the direct link, which is interpretingwine.com slash 540. You can find links to both series episodes in the description below. And of course, I'd love to have you following along with me on social media where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook and at Wine Podcast on Twitter. That brings the Uruguay Producer Series to a close for now. All that's left to say is a massive thank you to both series guests, Santiago Decas in episode 539 and Francisco Carrao in episode 540. Make sure you're subscribed to be alerted when the next series goes live. See you soon.